Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about the future of television because I think it's really exciting. You know, we're looking at an industry that's been around for 60 years. It hasn't really changed that much. There's a value chain that's kind of been the same since the beginning that, you know, works around brands that, you know, go to agencies and agencies then go to broadcasters and then broadcasters work with production companies who then create content that we consume at home. It's very much a 10-foot lean-back experience and has been traditionally uh, over the past five or six decades. But I think TV is going to change. And there are a number of really good reasons for that. We've seen change in both print and music, for example, over the last five or ten years that have radically altered the value chain and how it operates. Funny enough, I was in the print industry. My background is as a journalist. And um, it, it's, it changed so fast, it was like I woke up one morning and there was 200 million bloggers out there. Uh, suddenly, you know, everybody was writing, and it kind of devalued what I did in a way, but also it ha I had to look at myself and say, well, how do I reinvent myself in this new world where there is just a lot more writers, a lot more content being produced? I then went to the music industry afterwards. I tried that out for a while, and it was also interesting, but it also radically changed. We saw, you know, we suddenly found a world that was disrupted completely by P2P and and new technologies that allowed for people to consume music when they want it, where they want it, and what device they want it on, uh, radically altering the value chain in music. Um, that's why you see so many gray-haired bands playing to gray-haired to gray people or older people like me that are 45, is because those guys aren't making money from their records anymore. The royalties are gone, uh, so they're having to go back on the road and, per and, and perform live. That's one of the, the problems. The only, mu the only money in music really today is in merchandising and in, in live performances because uh, the fact is we don't, we're, not, we're not buying music in the same way anymore. An economy of scale is not caught up yet. But let me go forward to the future of television. I'm using those two as kind of an example of you know, how I think television is going to change. And I'm not an authority on television in any sense. This is my opinion, in a way. Uh, over two and a half, three years, I've been writing a website called appmarket.tv where I've been uh, daily basically covering the industry and, 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 and looking at, from a B2B perspective, how it might change. So I've done a lot of writing and a lot of research over the years, and we have you know, some new terminology in our lexicon in the TV world, like social TV and transmedia and second screening. and you know, our, our, We're having to change our own language to keep up with the way technology is changing. Now, I grew up without a TV, really, essentially, until I was 14. My father was kind of a pragmatic you know, Dutch... Uh, immigrant who didn't actually believe in television. It was the 60s, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I mean, that's not me and that's not my family, and we didn't sit around the fireplace and happily chat all day. But, you know, we played games. We did things. We interacted. We, you know, we had this really rich... I had a really rich growing up in many ways in that respect. We weren't all sitting around the TV uh, with visual Ritalin. <laughs> you know, that's what I call TV sometimes. It is, when I talk about the lean back, 10-foot experience, that's what TV kind of is in a way. I mean, it, there are, you know, certainly we learn a lot from television, we enjoy it, but it, it is very unidirectional. It is very one way. And it, it is a concept that many people have, their, have a problem getting around is that TV might change. You know, it could change because it is, we're so used to that. And if I had an iPhone, I'd pull it out right now, but I don't, and say, remember when this was just used for phone calls? <laughs> We are using devices in different ways, and I honestly believe that TV is going to change. And there are many good indicators, and many companies working in this space now, and broadcasters, entrepreneurs, um, you know, people willing to take risks. It, it, it is changing. The, di the big walls of the TV industry are coming down. You know, TV programs were made uh, by decisions by people in Hollywood and, or, or Hilversum in small rooms that, you know, they fed us what we think should be watched, rather than you know, us feeding them what we, they think they should deliver to us. So TV is becoming more interactive and more social today in many new ways. Here you can see, this is kind of like my family in a way. We have a couple of iPads now. You know, and they're actually communicating. They're doing, any, they're doing different things. They're multitasking. They're playing along with shows. They're, you know, and, and the way we're consuming television, and I think you'll see by some of the statistics I provide in further slides uh, from Nielsen and other parties, is changing. So the connected TV, I, I wanted to have an example of a gestural television, but I couldn't really get it to work very well myself. But Samsung's new TV is actually gest gestural, and it works on audio. So you can actually change channels by flicking, and you can talk to your TV. 
and it recognizes you as, uh, when you sit in front of it uh, as being the person who has control in a way. So I guess the center position in the couch is now, it's not the remote anymore. It's like, I'm here, the camera's facing me. Yeah, I've got control now. <laughs> so things are, you know, we're looking at television. Certainly companies are looking at television in new, unique ways, how we interact with it. So the pace of change, I'm just going to pick a couple out of here, but you can see the, the timeline here. Um, we're kind of working on Moore's Law in terms of innovation. It's rapidly changing the world we live in. TV took 13 years to reach 50 million viewers. iPhone applications hit 1 billion in nine months. So if you're expecting that the lean back 10-foot ex uh, experience is going to be like, is solidified in cement as the way we consume television, think again. So here's some, some stats that I pulled out from AppMarket. 87% um, of US smartphones and 88% of tablet owners use it while watching TV. Wow. Uh, not all of them are engaging with television. Actually, a lot of them are doing email and getting away from commercials, I think most people um, would agree. 62% uh, of TV viewers pick up the phone as soon as TV advertising break starts. Now, that's an interesting statistic, and I'll tell you why. Because when I talked about that value chain of brands working with agencies spending $200 billion globally, by the way, of a half a trillion dollar industry, they traditionally bank on large audiences and they bank on the fact that we're going to watch those 30-second commercials. <laughs> well, this kind of behavior indicates that people aren't really watching those commercials anymore. And the last 10 million audience in, in the United States for anything other than football was in 1999 with friends. So they don't have those mass audiences anymore. And clearly, people, uh, uh, consumer behavior is changing, and they're actually doing other things when commercials come on. So that trigger, that's creating a trigger and a very big threat to the way the current value chain works. How is content going to be funded if we can't do this? Where are we, how are we going to make this work? Um, and I, I can almost feel them trembling sometimes in the broadcast world because they've already seen what happened in music and they've already seen what happened in print. And now they're seeing you know, the horizon of their own industry as being a little bit under threat. And the brands themselves, um, Red Bull, they don't buy 30-second spots even though they have more than enough money to. You know what? They create their own content. It's called branded content. They actually created a whole lifestyle around their product, and they sell over 1,000 episodes. So now we have brand selling content. Huh, that's strange. There's also some companies like Endemol, you probably maybe heard of because you're Dutch, or Fremantle, um, and another company called All3 Media in the UK, who uh, are also experimenting. These are production companies who create a lot of content that we watch, but they don't, they're faceless, they're nameless. We don't know them like we know the, the person who produces the music. They're just sort of the nobodies, the things that fly by at the end of the scene of the, of the film or the TV show. These companies are now going direct to consumer. They're, pu they're building applications, uh, all three media in the case of the UK, on Google TV. So you know what? They can, people can go to their Google TV uh, application store and they can watch the best of British television and they can pay the producer direct. So then we're having really in a situation where we have an artist to fan relationship, which is the big buzzword in the music industry. Artist to fan, artist to fan, artist to fan. That whole value chain in music that used to be the artist, manager, promoter, record label, everybody else between the person who creates the intellectual property and the person who consumes it has all but disappeared. Lady Gaga doesn't need Ticketmaster to sell her tickets when she has 14 million followers on Facebook. That's the new dynamic. And in, in a way, it is. To me, it's about democratization in a way. Um, typically in the broadcast industry, they talk about disruption. Uh, I call it democratization. <laughs> I call it breaking the walls down. I, I call it, you know, technology has allowed us to, pre, uh, uh, to, to cr not only create content easier, but it's, um, you know, it's, we, we also have new channels to get that content to new viewers. So I'm going to explain this rather quickly because I'm running out of time, but this is sort of how I envision this new world. The television is the center. The television will not... Smart TV is, is, is an oxymoron. I think it will, will remain dumb. I think this, the iPad will become the central device for discovery and dissemination um, or whatever touchscreen device. It's, it's very easy to find something you like on your iPad and flick it to your television. That's the new technology. That's what's working. That's what's coming down the road. So we have communicate, people talking to each other, TVOIP. We have what I call social TV, a very common word where uh, how content is found and how it's disseminated amongst your friends, your Facebook graph, and those sorts of things. We have uh, context. I love context. I don't know how many of you have actually got up from your TV and gone to your computer and said, oh, who's in that movie? <laughs> and to find something about it before you want to watch it. Well, you know, there's, com there's companies now that are making that really easy, so, you know, you're getting context while you're watching the show, if you want to. 
You don't have to. You can lean back and engage. But like the game, you know, we, we have this huge population of gamers now who are used to interacting with their content. So there is a significant proportion of what I call Generation G people who are now 40 years old, some of them, uh, who are used to that kind of engage. They, they like to engage with their content. Um, personalization TV that knows you, it understands your social graph, it looks at who your friends are, it, it gives you recommendations based on what you watch, what you, what you watched before, and what your friends watch, perhaps. Um, kind of takes the serendipity out of it a little bit, but I think that that's, you know, that's also something that's being worked on. Gamification, a clear one. Uh, a million pound drop in the UK, live show on Friday nights, 150,000 people playing along in real time during the show, on their second screens. They love it because they're smarter than the guy on the TV. Um, transmedia is a new word from Los Angeles, and basically it's the really creative writing uh, production community who are looking at devices in a different way than we do. Um, transmedia means taking the narrative of the story in different directions using different devices, so there's a real creative aspect to this whole new ecosystem as well. And community, of course, belonging to one group. The World Cup, these big events where, you know, the Olympics, where you got that app and you, you know, you've got this singular experience, uh, second screen or additional experience around one event. And commerce, of course, if that's going to change. Maybe they're going to find new ways to, to monetize television and the fact that I love that dress Jennifer Addison's wearing. No, I don't, but um, perhaps now I can buy it, you know, or I can find out who made it. You know, this kind of contextual stuff will also open up new opportunities in terms of commerce. So Play Along TV, I'm going to do the voice of Holland because I think they're great. There's a company, some friends of mine in Amsterdam do it. It's one of the most successful second screen uh, pro projects globally right now, doing very well. Uh, it's a 24-7 pre-show gameplay. You can actually hear the artist before the show and make your decision like the judges do. And uh, they had 650,000 downloads last season. That's pretty good for a little country like Holland. TV with context on the second screen. Uh, Zbox in the UK, they are actually uh, using metadata and you're able to, it, they're extracting keywords from the actual real live stream of television and creating keywords that you can click on and find out what's being said about that word on, on, on uh, uh, Twitter or on Wikipedia or other sources, so it's automatically providing that context. And of course, sports is a natural, fantasy, fantasy leagues and betting. Uh, we're going to see more of that. There is now second screen betting in the UK. Um, and the social program guide that goes backwards. Imagine if you could, uh, you know, have your EPG on the screen and you could say, well, you know, I don't want to watch that, I don't want to watch what was on before. Well, actually, you can do that now. <laughs> in the UK, they're experimenting with that technology. So it's, it is television that's uh, stored in the cloud and available immediately almost. And uh, I just want to go a little bit into direct democracy because the Dutch elections were really great this year. The second screen technology was not only used to allow the, consumer, the, the viewers to vote on who, was, who won the debates, but those votes were the ones that counted. RTL decided to use those votes as the ones that reflected the actual outcome of the debates, which when I told an American at New York Times recently, uh, he was absolutely blown away. The fact that we have come that far in Holland and that we are taking these kinds of challenges and these kinds of risks and actually executing them. And the three debates were powered by the second screen. There was a mixture of fear and excitement and the, better, uh, the predictions were better than the official polls. There you go. So the journey to TV everywhere. TV you want to watch, when you want to watch it, on what device you want to watch it on. It's going to be the reduction of artificial scarcity, which is what an electronic program guide or what programming does. It tells us we have to be there to watch this or watch that. I mean, for live events, that's natural, but for everything else, it won't matter in five years. You can watch whatever you want. And setting TV free like the music industry. TV on demand in the future will be pulled and it won't be pushed. Thank you very much.